You're watching LMCC, your community TV. Welcome to Talking Points. I'm Kay Erickson with the League of Women Voters of South Tonka. And today we're talking about Minnesota's 2019 legislative session with Representative Kelly Morrison. She was first elected in 2018, and this is her first year as a legislator. Before we get into talking about the legislature, first can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about your district? Sure. I'm Kelly Morrison, and I am a physician, actually. I've been practicing here in Minnesota for almost 18 years been married for 22 years and I have three teenagers and my husband and I and our kids and our two dogs have lived in Deep Haven <laughs> for 10 years. Tomorrow actually, we moved here a decade ago. Um, and our, my district is 33B, which encompasses nine communities in the South Lake Minnetonka area. Um, and we're an interesting district because we are deeply purple, which I see as an opportunity. We have, it's one of the, the, the kind of di di disappearing places <laughs> where Democrats and Republicans and independents live next door to each other, um, which I see as an opportunity. I think that's great because I'm always looking for things that bring us together. Yeah. Well, Minnesota is unusual in that we have a divided legislature. Republicans have a majority in the Senate, Democrats have a majority in the House, and we have a Democratic governor. But despite that, you folks were able to come together and pass a number of bills on a bipartisan basis. You increased money for education. You enacted uh, protections for seniors living in assisted living facilities. You had some targeted tax cuts. You passed a hands-free cell phone driving bill that I think takes effect tomorrow. That's right. Um, you increased local government aid, and mm -hmm. for the first time in 30 years, you increased the monthly stipend for people getting money through the Minnesota Family Investment Program. Mm -hmm. So you were able to come together on a number of things, um, but I'm sure there are a number of things that, <laughs> that you had to leave on the table. So what was your uh, t overall impression of this session, which was your first as a legislature, because <laughs> you were elected in 2018, so That's what right. was your overall take on that? That's right. Thing. You know, I think there's a lot that we can all be proud of in Minnesota as one of, there's some debate as to whether or not Alaska also has a divided legislature, but we like to think of ourselves as the only state in the country that currently I has was wondering about that. I, a divided I, legislature. Yeah. And in these very partisan times, that is challenging. Yeah. Uh, but we found a way to craft a budget that <laughs> works for most Minnesotans, which I think we can all be proud of. We showed the country that it can be done. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was very heartened by that. The end of the session was imperfect, um, <laughs> but I think when you're dealing with a divided legislature, when both sides come away with some wins and a few disappointments, we probably did something right. Mm -hmm. We made compromises, which is what politics is supposed to be about. Yeah, that's how it generally works. <laughs> now you're one of four physicians in the legislature and you were uh, Vice Chair for the Health and Human Services Committee. What were your goals for the committee coming into the session? Well, as a physician, it's really important to me that people get the health care that they need. So figuring out how we can get everyone access and make it affordable is the ultimate challenge for our state yeah. and for our country right now. Uh, and addressing the disparities that exist in health care in our country is, uh, excuse me, in our state specifically, uh, is a big challenge that we have to take on because that's the future of our state and if we care about Minnesota we got to tackle that and health care is a piece of that solution. Um, in terms of your goals for the going, going into the session for the committee, what were you hoping to do? Well, I was really hoping that we could consider a Minnesota care buy-in option. I campaigned on that. Uh, the governor was for a version of that. Uh, and I do think that as we look at, if we think of states as sort of um, the laboratories for democracy, mm -hmm. um, I think it's a good way to experiment on a state level to see if this is a viable way of increasing access and bringing down costs. So that did not pass. That's true. <laughs> so um, is that, I assume it would be a goal for the next session. Are there other things you'd like to see the committee accomplish next session? I really hope that we will tackle that again next session. Um, I think that protecting the provider tax was a, a very yes. important yeah. um, accomplishment in my mm -hmm. view. Uh, the provider tax is imperfect, as all taxes <laughs> are. 
Uh, but it's worked pretty well for more than 25 years to provide um, health care to some of our more vulnerable Minnesotans. Mm -hmm. More than a million Minnesotans rely on the health care yeah. access fund, which uh, the provider tax fund. So if we had let that revenue source go away, a lot of us would have been in real trouble. Um, now, you tried to enact the Drug Price Transparency Act. Can you tell us about that and what it would do? Yeah, I think this, this piece of legislation has real potential, uh, and it's got a lot of bipartisan support, which I really strove to achieve in this session. It worked really hard to reach across the aisle, uh, particularly in our divided legislature, and again, reflecting my district. Mm -hmm. We, I, I represent everyone in 33B, <laughs> and that's across the political spectrum. So the Drug Price Transparency Act was, is one way of trying to figure out why the cost of prescription medications is so high right now. Uh, Julie Rosen, who is a Republican senator, uh, authored the bill in the Senate. So it was a Republican yeah. author in the Senate and me in the House. Uh, so I was really hopeful that it would get yeah. through, but it got lost in the mix in the conference committee. Um, uh, negotiations but the idea of the bill is to ask the pharmaceutical companies to explain their pricing <laughs> so for drugs that come on market at a very high price or drugs that have been on the market or are newly acquired and increase exponentially over a 12 and 24 month period mm -hmm. we're asking those companies to uh, report to the health commissioner mm -hmm. why though just explain why those prices are what they are oh. What, how much, what are the manufacturing costs? What are the distribution costs? What are the marketing costs? What's research and development? Why are these drugs so expensive? And this is not to demonize pharmaceutical companies. They've done many great things for many of us, and we need them. Um, but they've also made a lot of money in their industry. Um, and so there has to be a balance. And a lot of Minnesotans are struggling to afford their medications. Yeah. This just devastating example of Alex Smith, this young man who died 26 years old because he was rationing his insulin because he couldn't afford it. That shouldn't happen in Minnesota. And so we're, this, this is one way, I think, to try to come at this. Yeah. There's not going to be one magic pill. There's no one <laughs> solution to all of these yeah. problems. But I think this provides some information and probably puts a little bit of pressure on the companies um, to, to explain what's going on there. Yes, when when the prices for insulin skyrocket, the price for EpiPen goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's you expect companies to make a reasonable profit. Exactly. But, it's not, but is there anything else we can do besides you know? I'm sure well, you looked at all those things in your committee. I've been I've been serving on um, this working group to look at the Alex Smith bill because okay. that also had bipartisan support, but was lost in the conference mm -hmm. committee negotiations. Um, and so this is a bipartisan, bicameral group that's been meeting all mm -hmm. summer okay. to try to resurrect this bill. Um, and I'm really hopeful. We've agreed on a framework where we're still haggling over the, how the funding source. So it's always about the funding, isn't <laughs> that's it? That's right. Great that's ideas, right. But where do you get the funding? Yeah. Some of us, some of us think that the pharmaceutical companies should be asked to participate, and then others of us think that the taxpayers <laughs> should pay for it. I favor asking the pharmaceutical companies who have profited so much mm -hmm. from these medicines um, to participate so that no Minnesotan dies because they can't access insulin, which is a, a hormone that's been around for many decades. It shouldn't be that expensive. Yeah. And it isn't in most countries in the world. That's right, that's yeah. right. So, And then there's opioid addiction, which is a problem in Minnesota um, and the rest of the country for yeah. that matter. Um, and there was a, a bill to increase fees on drug manufacturers. Can you talk about that and what that Sure. Will do, will do. Yeah, and boy, I have, I have so much respect um, for Chris Eaton, who's a senator who lost a daughter to this epidemic, mm -hmm. and Dave Baker, representative, who lost a son to this epidemic. He's a Republican, she's a Democrat, and they've worked uh, together for years now uh, trying to find solutions to this mm -hmm. problem. They are just driven to make sure that other families don't go through what they did. And I've just got so much admiration for both of them. And I'm so pleased that we were able to craft an imperfect, <laughs> yeah. but, but a pretty strong bill that really does a lot toward um, prevention and treatment. Well, you have to start somewhere. And a lot of things, even like Social Security, 
got started, but it gets changed over time. So there sure. are opportunities to improve it and build That's on right. it. That's right. But you've got to start somewhere. That's right. Um, yeah, we lost, I believe, 422 Minnesotans yeah. last year wow. to this epidemic. And I want to see that number go and to zero. I assume zero. that's all over the state. That's just not in That the is all over the state. That's right. Yeah, yeah. our rural areas are really, really struggling with this problem. Um, education, you folks increased the education funding by if, correct me if I'm wrong, $1.2 billion over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, did you support the increase? Um, did, are there other things you think we should have done? I did support that increase. You know, our education funding was cut during the recession um, mm -hmm. and really had many districts had fallen way behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and education, as we all know, is the future of our state. <laughs> One of the reasons that we are such a successful state and we're the home to so many Fortune 500 companies is we historically have had such a well-educated workforce. Companies want to come here, um, and we need them to come here because we <laughs> yes. want good jobs for our people. We need to grow the economy. Um, the special education um, cross-subsidy has created a big burden yeah. on, on funding our schools, so I was proud that we froze that at least for a oh. year. Uh, but we need help from the federal government, um, mm -hmm. who has not lived up to its promise of funding that. It's expensive to educate our kids, um, but it's an investment that I think we all agree is worth it. Right. Should we have done more? Um, or is there, are there other things besides just increasing um, the spending? I mean, I know it helps the individual school districts. I assume it helps all of the school districts all over the state. It does. It does. That's right. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that, that I wish we could have done. Um, you can't have everything. No. We, have, we have finite resources. Um, but again, getting back to addressing our disparities, um, increasing the number of teachers of color, I think, mm -hmm. is an important goal when we're talking about that. Um, kid, there's a lot of evidence that kids learn best when they are mm -hmm. taught by people who that look like them mm -hmm. and have similar backgrounds. So we, we, have very, we have relatively few teachers of color um, in our state compared to how many kids of color we have, and so that's a, an opportunity for us to improve. Which kind of gets at the achievement gap, mm -hmm. which is, continues to be a problem for Minnesota. That's right. Um, that's right. Uh, um, and you, when you look at, um, I think about this with health care, too. We, you know, we talk so much about health care. Health, really, only about 20% of our health has to do with health care, <laughs> going to the doctor or the mm -hmm. hospital. 80% of it has to do with the social determinants of health. So transportation, nutrition, pollution, the environment, all those things yeah. factor in. And that's true for education, too. If you yeah. don't have stable housing and a hot meal, it's pretty hard to learn. Yeah. So it's education always, and all these issues are all, always all tied together. That's right. And you've got to work on them all at the same time. Nothing <laughs> exists in a silo. That's yeah. right. They all overlap yeah. and intersect. Yeah. Transportation. Um, let's talk about the best way to fund our roads and bridges. <laughs> it's a tricky one. You had a proposal <laughs> to uh, increase the gas tax. What's the right balance between a dedicated funding source and taking money from others? areas, which I assume is what you have to do. Right, it's, a, it's a huge challenge, and our roads are in serious disre disrepair. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've got a C and a D on our roads and bridges, <laughs> um, and to the point where they've determined that Minnesotans on average spend about $1,000 a year repairing the damage that our roads have done to their cars. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we're kind of losing money in the end either way, um, and we all drive on our roads. We know how bad they are. <laughs> Sure. Minnesota also has many thousands more roads than most states. We have 133,000 mm -hmm. miles of roads, um, so it's a big task for us. Yeah. I think as we as we talk about transitioning away from fossil fuels um, and in hopefully increase the number of um, electron, electric vehicles that we use, those numbers are still really small. Only about 1% mm -hmm. of the cars on our roads in Minnesota are electric vehicles. <laughs> So I think a transitional fix is to increase the gas tax. I did favor that. And I think there needs to be a way to um, make it somewhat more progressive because it, it can be a regressive tax. Mm, yeah. um, so there has to be a way to give lower income people a break on that. But in general, if you use our roads, you should pay for our roads, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and that's one way to do it. But we, we're in, we really mm. need to address our roads and bridges. Uh, we don't want to see another 35W bridge collapse situation. <laughs> no. That was horrifying. And 
Um, so this is this is kind of an emergency yeah. in my view. Is there any way to get it so that it um, is built in to be increased a little bit every year instead of having to have this uh, big kind of percentage looking at us all the time every five or ten years? Yeah, yeah. Well, part of the problem is we've let it go for so That's long. What I mean, yeah. yeah. So Are if we proposals to do that, if we scheduled re more regular repair. Um, and perhaps look for alter alternate funding sources. It's tricky. We have a lot of <laughs> needs in our state. Um, and we're a relatively high tax state, and we need yeah. to keep a balance there, yeah. I think. Um, part of the reason Minnesota is such a great place to live and work is because we invest in our state, but we don't want our taxes to get so high that we scare people away. <laughs> True. We want, we want businesses and people to thrive here. So it's a balance in my mind. Thank you. It's time for a short break. When we come back, I'll continue our conversation about this year's legislative session. Check out LMCC on Facebook. Be sure to like and friend us so you can keep up with all the happenings or to watch one of your favorite videos. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Kay Erickson with the League of Women Voters of South Tonka. In this segment of the program, Representative Kelly Morris and I will continue our discussion about this year's legislative session. You co-authored multiple bills relating to the Equal Rights Amendment. Can you talk about that and why that was important? Women and all people are not discriminated on the basis of gender. And so the bill in the House asked to put it on the ballot in Minnesota. Okay. Um, that did not pass the Senate, so it won't be on the ballot, but mm -hmm. we'll try to, to come at it again next time. I trust the people of Minnesota, and, and I think it's a reasonable question to, to place. What are some of the discrepancies you see in, in the treatment of men and women that need to be addressed by the Equal Rights Amendment? Well, there are all kinds of areas where women can be treated differently, and they don't have direct protection oh, okay. under the law. Um, so I think it's important. Okay. Um, you also co-authored the local options bill for ranked choice voting, which didn't get passed this year. Why do you think it's important for local communities to be able to vote this way instead of just one person, one vote? Yeah, I think ranked choice voting is a real opportunity for us. Uh, the way it works is if people, if one candidate doesn't get more than 50% mm -hmm. of the vote, um, it automatically goes to a factor in like, the other choices. So the voter will rank their top three candidates, okay. for example. So the effect of this is to have candidates campaign to everyone and mm -hmm. not to a smaller percentage mm -hmm. of the electorate. It tends to make elections more civil. There's less attacking. There's less negative advertising. Uh, and, if and it creates kind of an instant runoff, so it saves money, mm -hmm. so we don't have to go <laughs> through that process again. And the other effect of it is that the, the person who wins, by definition, has at least some support from, mm -hmm. more, from the majority of the electorate. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's a great idea to let, uh, and this bill just allowed communities to decide whether or not they wanted to do ranked choice voting. So it's not a statewide initiative. Okay. So I think it's a great way for communities to try it out, and I think there's real potential for improving our democracy with it. Aren't cities, some cities already doing it? Some cities do already do it. Yep, maybe? Minneapolis does, that's right. Okay, so we do have some experience with it. That's right. Um, all over the country, actually. Yeah. It's, oh, okay. it's, it's really catching on. I think there's real potential there. Okay. So maybe next time. Yeah, I think we all agree <laughs> that it would, we'd all appreciate it if our politics were more <laughs> civil. <laughs> Climate change is a, an issue for the country, for Minnesota. Uh, what do you think Minnesota can do as a state to address climate change? Are there initiatives that you support? Yeah, um, the, the climate crisis is really, it's sort of become a cliche expression, but it <laughs> is the existential threat that we face. It's an emergency, and so we have to act. Uh, and the bill that uh, Representative Jamie Long introduced in the House um, called for setting a goal of creating 100% um, carbon-free electricity by 2050. Um, Xcel Energy has already committed to that, and oh. a business. Uh, and the CEO of Xcel has been quoted saying, it sh climate shouldn't be a partisan issue, and boy, do I agree with him. Mm -hmm. this, this could be our great national project mm -hmm. if we had leadership that would take it on and inspire all of us to do it. It's, it's going to take a big national effort, but at a minimum, we can do things on the state level. So if Excel is, be, is supporting this, what are they 
changing in order to sure. um, to accomplish that? Are they going to do more wind and solar? or They already are. They mm -hmm. already are. It's actually interesting because they've learned that wind has now become cheaper than coal. <laughs> and so from just a pure business standpoint, they want to do wind energy mm -hmm. because it's cheaper for them. Um, and clearly it's better for the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so more wind, more solar. We've got to invest in research uh, to mm -hmm. figure out the best ways. There's some really exciting research that's being done uh, where they're, used, they're capturing carbon from the atmosphere mm -hmm. and recycling it to, to power things. I know it. <laughs> um, so it's important that we invest in those areas because uh, we're, we're close to teetering to a yeah. point of no return. Well, in Minnesota, I think from what I've read, is is getting warmer faster than other parts of the country. That's so, exactly uh, right. It's important. Yeah. Um, now, Minnesota always prides itself on its rivers and lakes. Um, what do you see as the biggest threat to our water resources? That's a great question, and it's so relevant in District 33B, where we <laughs> almost have more water than land. Probably. Uh, with Lake Minnetonka, our arguably best loved and most used mm -hmm. lake in the state. Um, so protecting our water is important, and climate change <laughs> relates to this. As we have more precipitation, um, there's more runoff. Yeah. Um, from agriculture, uh, from lawns. Um, so we have increased pesticides and fertilizers, salt, salt and sediment yeah. going into our lakes and rivers. That create that, uh, and then the warming waters with the warming climate uh, creates algae blooms, um, and then the pollution is toxic to aquatic life. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got big challenges. Um, we need to look at how we do agriculture a little bit differently and. and one of, the, one of the small changes that was made under the Dayton administration that was helpful mm -hmm. was creating buffers mm -hmm. um, around farm areas uh, that are next to, to waterways. Mm -hmm. um, to, and and the, when there are native plants and a variety of plants mm -hmm. planted, they, they create a filter for water <laughs> and they actually clean it out before it hits, it hits the, the bodies of water. So there's a lot we can do. Mm -hmm. Um, but we got more to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in the cities, the farmers would say, you know, we're not the only ones that have issues. Absolutely. Salt uh, is a huge issue. That's Are there exactly ways right. or is there research about other alternatives for putting as much salt on our roads as we do because the salt goes right in and changes yeah. the, the, I would assume, the chemistry of the water. That's exactly at some right. Point. That's exactly right. And we use sand sometimes too, but that also runs off and creates sediment <laughs> so as well. So we probably can all use less. Mm -hmm. And we can slow down on the roads <laughs> uh, and make sure that mm -hmm. we're driving defensively and mm -hmm. far away from the driver in front of us. Um, but we probably will need to look at uh, changing some of the laws um, before we ruin our lakes and rivers. Did the legislature do anything um, pertaining to invasive species, um, which is a huge problem on, that is on huge Minnetonka problem. and uh, the other things that are coming in, things I've never spiny things. Right. <laughs> See right. Are other yeah. things that are coming in that we've, you know, Aqua haven't seen before. That's right. Aquatic invasive species is a big challenge in our in our beautiful state that is rich with lakes. Mm -hmm. um, I actually authored a bill to increase the fee on watercraft, mm -hmm. um, which was five dollars for three years per mm -hmm. boat, which seemed pretty low to me, uh, and has been that since about 1986. So I proposed raising that so okay. that we could raise revenue to, to prevent and treat the hmm. spread of aquatic invasive okay. species. So I proposed $20 <laughs> over three years, actually. And um, wait, with you know compromise in <laughs> politics, we landed on $10.60 okay. for, for three cents. years. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> so that will create money um, for the lake associations okay. and for the DNR. We also invested um, further funds um, in helping the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Re um, Species Research Center, which is affiliated with the University of Minnesota. They're doing great work. Um, so hopefully we're gonna make some progress in that area. Uh, but it's important that we all, if we take boats from lake to lake, really that we really follow the rules and make sure that we're not transmitting um, these invasive species from lake to lake. When that $5 fee started, I think there were um, there was just maybe one species um, <laughs> identified, and they were in about 40 lakes, and now it's all over the state, oh, and there are yeah. multiple species. So we have to proceed with real caution. Mm -hmm. Me too. Changing the subject completely. Yeah. <laughs> 
Gun violence prevention was also raised at the legislature. Did you support proposals to expand background checks or private gun transfers or allowing guns to be temporarily removed from people who pose a threat to themselves or others? I did support those measures, Kay. Um, they are, um, I actually liked the approach uh, that was taken to just focus on these two bills mm -hmm. that have actually majority support all over the state. 90% of Minnesotans favor universal criminal background checks. So there's real consensus on these issues. Mm -hmm. Rather than trying to go after a bunch of different angles, uh, we all have the goal of keeping our kids and communities mm -hmm. safe, whether you're a gun owner or not. Um, and if you're a law-abiding gun owner, n none of these mm -hmm. would apply to you. So this one of them just closed the loophole so that background checks become universal. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other extreme risk protection orders help law enforcement remove guns from people who are a danger to themselves or others. Uh, and we've had experience in other states with this, and we've got data now that show oh. that it has decreased the risk of suicide, particularly suicide mm -hmm. is one of our major problems yeah. with yeah. gun violence. Mm -hmm. um, I think we lost um, 400 and almost 50 people last year to gun death suicide in Minnesota. In Minnesota alone. Yeah, in Minnesota wow. alone. Wow. Um, so most Minnesotans agree that these are measures that, that we should be taking. Um, switching to business. Yeah. Um, I've read articles that say Minnesota isn't as business friendly as it might be. Are there things that Minnesota is doing or can do to make sure that startups want to locate here, that it's easier for entrepreneurs to be in Minnesota as opposed to other states? Yeah, that's an important question because as we were talking about earlier, it is so important that we attract new businesses and that we keep mm -hmm. our best minds here too to mm -hmm. reinvest in our state. Um, the best thing we can do is have a healthy, educated workforce. That's a huge piece. Mm -hmm. And so investing in health and investing in education is a part <laughs> of that. Um, I also think that I actually attended um, a chamber breakfast a little while ago, and the question was posed, what would do the most to improve mm -hmm. the business environment in Minnesota? Um, decrease the personal income tax rate, decrease the business tax, or decrease capital gains, I believe the third choice was. Overwhelmingly, it was income tax. Mm -hmm. Businesses see that they want to have more of their money in their own individual pockets so that they can make those investments. Um, and so keeping our state income tax at a reasonable mm -hmm. level, mm -hmm. I think, is important. Okay. Um, the angel tax credit, I think, is, is an important part of attracting um, new businesses um, to our state. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, a, that's an innovative way to... And that does what? It, it um, creates a tax credit for people who invest oh. Oh. in new tech. There's sort of a list of um, startups that oh, are okay. supported this way. Okay. Yeah. So there is something being done. That's absolutely, nice. <laughs> absolutely. Now, while there were significant areas of agreement and a number of important laws were passed, mm -hmm. the legislative session still ended in closed door negotiations among leadership. Is there anything that can be done to increase transparency at the end of the session so it's not all done at the end? It's, a it's real, been that way for years, I understand. I know. It's a real challenge. You know, the joke was that there's no such thing as a special session anymore because <laughs> they're all special. Because <laughs> oh, um, we seem to almost always have a special session now. And that, that's a problem. That's not, that's not what our Constitution calls for. <laughs> we should be able to get the work done in the time allotted. Um, and I think that some of it, I think that Governor Walz and Majority Leader Gazelka and Speaker Hortman started the session mm -hmm. off on a really positive note, saying, you know what, let's get the uh, non-controversial mm -hmm. uh, items that were in the big omnibus prime bill that Governor Dayton vetoed, let's get those done and then we can get into the more thorny political mm -hmm. issues. And I thought that was very hopeful, and I think the three of them worked pretty well together. But it shouldn't come down to three people making the final decisions in the end the way it did. I think we'd all like to see more transparency. We'd like to see those negotiations happen in a more public way. Um, and I don't know if we need to have tighter rules on conference committees mm -hmm. when there's a House bill and a Senate bill that differ slightly. At the end of session, conference committees are appointed and they hash through, and those are those meet publicly, mm -hmm. hash through trying to make compromises in the bill that they can then give to the governor to sign. Mm -hmm. um, and there were some chairs of conference committees who just refused to participate. And I guess I don't think that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. I think there maybe should be some requirement. Maybe if you don't show up to conference committee, you don't get to vote. <laughs> 
Um, so I think there's some opportunity there. Um, Representative Jean Pulowski um, has started some legislative reform um, hearings this summer. Mm. Um, he's a Democrat, and he is he's very interested in improving the process too. So. We were able to craft a budget that <laughs> yes, works for Minnesota, absolutely. as I said before, but um, it could have been better. <laughs> there could have been more transparency. Thanks. Now, is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't talked about or that you'd like to say about the legislative session in general again? Well, you know, I just want to reiterate, I'm sort of a half full optimistic kind of a person, and I, I left the session feeling that way too. There are a lot of really good people on both sides of the aisle trying to do the right thing for our state, and that was really heartening to me. <laughs> um, and I go back to District 33B, where we have Democrats and Republicans and independents living next door to each other. We need to get back to talking to each other and listening to each other. I think we could use more listening in politics. <laughs> Let's bring the temperature down a little mm -hmm. bit and let's all figure out what's best for our state together. Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your insights about the session and thank you for your service. Well, thanks so much for the <laughs> opportunity. Programs like this are just part of what League does to make democracy work. We educate our members and our communities about issues, about how government works. We lobby on our positions at the local, state, and national levels. We're nonpartisan, that means we don't support political parties or candidates. Our South Tonka League is open to everyone 16 years of age and older, and we serve cities in southwest Hennepin County. We invite you to join us. You can find out more about our league on our website, lwvsouthtonka.org. Finally, I'd like to thank the Lake Minnetonka Communications Commission for the opportunity to present this program, and thank you for watching. <laughs>